And now, a native podcast with Matt and Zach. All right, guys, and welcome to uh, Native Podcast today. Uh, we have an interview uh, with Brian Begay. This is a, a connection between Matt. This is one of your good friends. So I don't know if you want to go ahead and introduce him or let Brian take the stage. Uh, I, I don't know how that I works. Think, uh, I think I'll let Brian uh, just kind of introduce himself and and uh, who he is and and some details about himself. Hi, uh, my name is Brian Begay. Um, I... I grew up in Kingman, Arizona. I'm a part of the Navajo Nation or Diné. Um, we've always been taught to introduce ourselves Navajo, so I, I'll just do that for you. Um Yate, She Brian Bigay Yenishia, Katna Sun Initially, Tutsuni Bajas Chin, Sedish Dash Che, Tachi Dashanella. That's just me putting out there my internal paternal and my grandparents' clans out there. So if anybody's wondering, um, I've met a lot of people that way. They're like, oh, you're my relative. And um, right. yeah, it's pretty interesting, I think. Um, don't quote me on what plan means. I know there's like Tangle Water and Big Water and stuff, different plans for different areas, but. Right. You know yours yeah. and what's what's you. It's not like mm-hmm. Matt. Matt uses Bumble to find his family. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, real quick, since we're doing this kind of introduction, I'll let Zach kind of introduce himself too, because you're a guest and. And uh, but I'm Oglala Lakota, and Brian probably knows that. And uh, I actually met a cousin of mine in South Dakota on Bumble. So for the viewers out there, when you're traveling in your home tribal lands, uh, be real careful about who you talk with. You might be a cousin. Right? No, exactly. No, it's, <laughs> it's, that's that's funny. Actually, it was funny that we had that experience with Matt, but. Um, no, I I'm Little Shell Blackfoot here from Montana. Um, just so you're you're aware, um, our viewers are aware. You know, if you're tuning into this episode for the first time, um, me and Matt have you know we met at Oregon State. I I think that's where he met you as well, right? You were going to school at Oregon State as well. I don't I don't think our paths crossed. Uh, probably I don't I don't think it did. Yeah, we met in Oregon State. I went to OSU from 2018 to 2021. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was 2013 to 2015 is when I was there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. We actually started like, um, it was kind of like a graduate, like study hall type thing at the long, the native longhouse. And, yeah. and it was, I, I think it was through your roommate, Brian, that I like met you. Yeah. Uh, and, and then we just, we just kind of, I don't know from there. And then Bobby met my, or he met, Brian met my roommate Bobby and and like we just kind of ended up you know kind of doing things together outdoors and had a lot of fun yeah I was uh, unhoused for a while so I (laughs) couch surfed at their place for about a month oh wow yeah yeah Brian had a corner living room chair with like a tv stand tray that was his little home for a minute <laughs> Dude, that was yeah. for hours though like mark had that one where he was in like he was in like a closet like in like you'd open up the pantry in the like this was like yeah but it was weird because it had a closet in there so it was like labeled a bedroom on the like listing but it was like basically the food pantry that's how big it was and that was his room and then someone had like a garage yeah corval Cor- Cor- Vegas is rough um but no i mean that that it's still kind of cool corvallis i mean i like it it was a cool college town don't get me wrong but um so that you went to school there i know you you went and did uh you did did education elsewhere as well um what uh yeah what what inspired you what got you into it what kind of what kind of set you down this path i guess yeah um i'd have to go all the way back to high school for that go for it go for it yeah i uh Went to school in Kingman High School. I grew up in Kingman, Arizona my whole life. Um, the reason why my family set down roots here was my dad worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs as okay. like a rangeland manager, resource manager down in Valentine, Arizona. Kingman, Arizona was the closest um, area, I guess, ideal for raising a family. And he worked with the Havasupai and the Wallapai tribes. Oh, cool. Um, 
so I grew up around this area and just taught me how to, he, he liked the outdoors and the resource himself. Um, yeah. Took me out fishing, hiking. Some of my earliest memories, I remember being that in outdoors and enjoying it. And I remember the local office of the Bureau of Land Management came to Kingman High School and talked to us about a career in natural resources. And already I'd been kind of thinking about what I was going to do in my future. And I was thinking, I remember I was a child and I wanted to become a marine biologist. Okay. And then that warped into me becoming maybe potentially thinking about hydrology or becoming a hydrologist. And I think my sophomore year of high school, but then when they came on, they started talking about cool stuff they're doing. I wanted to do that. And I started looking at colleges and stuff and I really like Flagstaff, Arizona. So I looked at their programs and forestry seemed like it'd be the ticket for me. Right. Looked up their prerequisites, figured I didn't probably have to go to Northern Arizona University right away. So I went to Yavapai College, which is by a lot of the tribal areas in Prescott, Arizona, mm -hmm. um, for the Yavapai tribes. And I got my associates of arts there. And then I went to Northern Arizona University to go to the School of Forestry. And I graduated with a, a Bachelor's of Science in Forestry and a minor in biology and a certificate in wildlife ecology management because when I was there, I really liked the idea of working in the forest, but then I found out you can actually work with wildlife and specialize in it. And wow. I thought that was rad. So I went down that route, got a job, and it worked for the Forest Service, working with wildlife. And then I knew that what I wanted to become was a wildlife biologist. And I had the training or the knowledge um, and I, but I could always take it to the next level, especially because I knew that being a wildlife biologist meant a lot of things and doing work with computer spatial science analysis, ge geospatial information sciences, stuff that I dabbled in my undergrad, I really wanted to learn more about. And I applied uh, specifically, there was a mentor um, that I had Sarah Hoagland and she reached out to me when I was living in Flagstaff after I graduated about an opportunity for scholarships at Oregon State University for an accelerated master's program. And I applied for it, got in, started doing the program for spatial science and analysis, met my advisor and my advisor get, gave me an opportunity for changing that MF master of forestry into a master's of science with a project. So I stayed on longer and I graduated 2021 and I've been working ever since. Oh, wow. That's really cool. Yeah. That's a cool journey. No, it really is. Especially because you even use the tribal, you even went to the tribal college as like part of like knowing that, Hey, yeah, like I'm going to need my, so like not the associate stuff, but the oh. credits, right? Yeah. I, I don't know if I'd call it tribal college. It's, it's more like a, just like a community college. Oh, okay. But, yeah. The area. Okay. I, I, but still, that's like, I mean, a lot of kids do that in Corvallis where they go to Linvet and that's what my brother did. Mm -hmm. well, and Zach, what Zach's hitting at is there, there's, there's a tribal presence. And so there's going to be native students at that college. Like, most oh, yeah. Area, right. So that's one of those ones that have the higher, you know, numbers of native, native students. Yeah. No, it's uh, really. Can you, Brian, can you just a little bit explain the geospatial analysis part of forestry? Because some of the viewers might not know exactly what that is. Oh, um, that's kind of dabbling into what my master's was in about, about spatial science, spatial being like space and um, geospatial, ge geographical information systems. They, they call it GIS, but essentially you have software that will look at maps, points of references, and you you can manipulate it and you can if you have a project let's say you have polygons and um shapes lines you can do rudimentary processing and essentially the the best way you could explain it is google maps okay. um there's a google map pro that i've used where you can start doing measurements and stuff and doing analysis you, you could keep taking it a step farther um, and do 
statistical analysis import more like light detection and ranging LIDAR, you can add that into it. Um, well, a pretty cool way to assess and analyze things, specifically if you're dealing with a resource like the national forest and you have a project, you'd want to know what the boundaries are, or you might want to look at aerial imagery um, of a stand of trees, or you might want to delineate something. All kinds of resources are out there for people to find that out. And there's a whole field for that. Right. Well, and then you get into like, like what you're saying is like, you can understand the forest better by having that data and like how you, how you manipulate. Yeah. So if this happens, this is, this is how we know if, if, if fires keep coming, this is how we know. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's a powerful tool, especially there's a lot of research and fire about how they're using infrared on yeah. air systems like drones to look through smoke to get fires out there. No, we were actually, we talked to a guy at Gathering Nations Pow Wow uh, last year who he, he does work like that uh, with, the, yeah. with the Forest Service and with, he's a, tri a tribally owned company actually. Oh. That was doing that. Yeah. I don't know what happened to it. Like he was like, I'm going to follow up with you. And I was like, okay. Because we do marketing too, right? So uh -huh. we specialize in that. And he, he was like, yeah, we need that. And I was like, okay. Nothing. No. Remember him? Yeah, I do. And like, he never contacted us. <laughs> he was so excited too. like native marketing company and just came up to me and Zach. Yeah, no, it was, it was super stoked. And it was cool. I mean, when you think about like where we're at in the forest and, and us as native people, I mean, we've been in the forest, we've been in the land, we've been working with it forever. You see uh, native like fire jumpers, native firefighting teams and they've been there since day one you know because they've been fighting the fire since day one so it only makes sense that uh you would fall into a, a position like this that you you know you'd follow in your father's footsteps but that probably comes from a lineage of of that nature of being connected to it like we are i mean it's so weird yeah. when you talk to non-natives about that connectiveness to nature it's like now i see that dog as an equal because it's a life form but i know i'm better than it yeah. and how i can use it but i'm going to still respect it because it's a life form it's a different it's a weird concept it's and it's i i've had trouble trying to convey that same thought mm -hmm. oceans about because my my parents grew up traditional navajo well at least i was raised traditional navajo i didn't go to church or anything like that and we would go uh, we had we would go back to the reservation when my grandparents lived in Tuba City, Arizona, a lot, and there'd be they'd have sings with medicine men and stuff, and you get to be a part of that. And there'd be Yeti Bache ceremony, where they'd have medicine men go out and they they do ceremonies and beauty way and enemy away ceremonies during the Western Navajo Nation Fair, being around that. But when you I'm into conflict or if there's something happening, like let's say I was a kid and I woke up with nightmares, I'd wake up and then my parents would smoke up and they'd give me a, like a bitter water drink and I'm, I'd go outside and you'd pray to, with corn pollen towards um, direction and then you'd pray for, um, whatever. I'd, I'd ask my mom like, what the heck am I even praying for? <laughs> She'd be like, just whatever you want, you know? But yeah that bled into a lot of my values in regards to the outdoors as my parents talked a lot about, at least my dad and my mom did about how it being something that's sacred. And there's always like a respect for it, right. which I thought was always kind of normal growing up, but not really, I guess, when I talk to a lot of people about it. And um, yeah, I feel like I have a really good relationship with the environment. And I think a lot of that came from my upbringing yeah no it's why no it's totally wild because like it's weird because like you sometimes can almost relate to the like that crazy hunter person that's out there you know that's like i'll shoot anything i'll shoot deer i'll shoot squirrels i'll shoot that and you're like yeah because they're that there's that conservationist in them but then there's that like we're not that close but i can relate to you but like like that's it like what you're saying is that's who gets it like in my opinion when you have those conversations that's the only people i've ever really have kind of understood that connectedness the understanding that that 
we're all the beings are connected and and we've been that way and other cultures it's not that way so like yeah growing up in it like i grew up i grew up in yeah. a Catholic family we went to catholic i went to catholic school my whole life so mm -hmm. definitely it's a interesting time to do to do all that right where where you're like i'm native i'm being taught by my family i'm native but i'm going to this school and you're being taught this and you're being taught these histories you know the land in the west was just given to the you know basically white folk and like that that didn't happen like i know better than that and then you 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 compare the two and then you add that even in just to like everything we've done because like these societies like we've managed the forest like you're saying like we've we've done that for thousands of years like we we've lived off this land yeah here i think are, here we are doing it today <laughs> we're still doing it and and i think it's interesting like with brian's work yeah you know, or as brian probably knows with the like northern california they're taking knowledge of prescribed burns and like implementing it now in forestry in a lot of places of like using this traditional knowledge to um you know burn the underbrush to prevent more severe wildfires and that's like a traditional knowledge that's like blending with science and like i think yeah brian yeah. traditional like, ecological knowledge yeah yeah tek and i think brian's a good example of blending the two like just with what he does and who he is you know yeah no that's exactly did you know there's a new native apparel company? No, I did not. It's called Shop LS574, named after the 574 federal tribes and the Little Shell descendancy of its founders. Wow, that's really cool, man. It is. It is becoming a spot to order native apparel by and for natives, working with native designers and teams to help best represent Indian country. That's awesome, dude. For sure. Now make sure to go pick up some a native podcast swag as well as other native gear while shopping at shopls574.com. Oh yeah, and do not forget to use code ANP10 to save on your next order. That's ANP10. Hey Matt, did you know there's a tribally owned net company? No, I did not. Not only are they tribally owned, but Blue Ribbon Nets also creates totally sustainable products. With Blue Ribbon Nets, not only are you getting quality nets, but even eco-friendly ones as well. That's awesome, dude. It sure is indeed. Make sure to use code RUGARU10 on your next Blue Ribbon Net order to save. Again, the code is RUGARU10, R-U-G-A-R-U-1-0. I am definitely getting a Blue Ribbon Net now. Tune in every Tuesday to hear your favorite native podcast. That's right. A Native Podcast has new episodes every week, ranging from boarding schools to Indian child welfare. Not only that, but we have Indian country covered from Maine to California and Florida to Alaska, Hopi to Blackfeet and Choctaw to Clinkett, and all those Crees in between. And all you other Natives and non-Natives out there, we want to remind you to tune in this Tuesday to A Native Podcast. Is your res runner in need of new lights? Well, look no further than our friends at Oxteo an industry leader in LED lights. Make sure to use code RUGARU on your next set of lights. That's R-U-G-A-R-U. -U. Um, well, you did, you did work with the Spotted Owl, too? Yeah. Uh, my so first, well, my first official position with the Forest Service, I did work with the Northern Spotted Owl. Um, I ended up taking a position near Klamath Falls or in the Fremont Wainema National Forest as a biological science technician. And they were doing a lot of monitoring and biological surveys for the spotted owl in that area. And that was honestly amazing. Initially, a bit of hesitancy on my side because for Navajos, owls are like a bad right. thing. Same with the Lakotas, Brian. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it means death, right? When you encounter an owl. It's, it's just like a bad omen. Um, it could mean a, a number of things. I, I've i always been hesitant to take it because my parents would be strongly right. against owls up being outside. But I was always more inquisitive for like a biologist at part as a kid. And I remember the first time I was out because you'd have to drive out at night and then you'd have these, they call them fox pros collars, but 
you'd go to these stations and then you'd call for these 10 minute clips of a spotted owl and it would pause and you'd listen. And then if you, you heard an owl, then you would uh, mark that down the direction, the distance, species. But sometimes there would be an owl that flew over your head and you have no way of knowing if it was a sensitive or endangered species at all. Nope. And then a lot wow. of times they caution you to be safe about these things, but um, this particular owl was pretty close to the road and I got my flashlight, my radio and my GPS and stuff and you'd hike out in the woods at night. And I probably got 50 meters away from the road before I turned back. But I remember I was walking in the woods thinking, what the heck am I doing? <laughs> like that. It felt like this weird, um, bad uh, feeling about like out, being raised out of the bad. What, am I really doing the right thing? But I immediately was just like, no, this is cool. And then I just kept walking and I didn't find the owl, but I came back thinking like that was just a cool experience. And I just love to have more of that. And thankfully I did. Right. No, that is really, that is really cool. Um, what other, I guess, cool projects like that have you, have you worked on? Yeah. Uh, the first project I got attached to was with um, the Wildlife Society. It's the, probably the premier wildlife professional society um, for the for wildlife professionals. And being a part of that club in Northern Arizona University was really great because they give you a lot of good opportunities to help. For example, I did black-footed ferret surveys near Sligman, Arizona for Arizona Game and Fish. I've helped look for pronghorns when they had the helicopter out and they're driving around trying to get, oh, wow. I don't know, information what they're doing. You just sit out there with uh, binoculars and stuff. And there's an opportunity that came up with a program called is, I think it was the Native American Student Professional Development Program, and it was a partnership with Forest Service and um, Native American tribes. Students can apply for it, and they could get sent on research assistantships across the nation. And one of them that I, I was I was split between two projects. One was working with bats and sharp-tailed grouse in um, Upper Peninsula of Michigan and Wisconsin, and another one was doing work with I believe it was Wolverines for the Blackfoot, for the for the Blackfeet. Yeah, yeah. I chose not to do the Wolverine re, uh, research, but I went to Michigan, and out of there, there was projects going on with the Northern Research Station near Rhineland, Wisconsin, and they were doing work with it's called the North American Bat Nabat. Um, protocol where you would go out these grids and you set up uh, um, they call them areas but they're essentially acoustic recording devices that can pick up bat presence species if you're lucky or you can read the, the spectrogram correctly and you have a, a, someone they can identify it but we were also put like suction cups on the truck and we would listen to bats while we drive around ro routes and stuff um, mm -hmm. at night and during the day we would set out detectors so that was really good experience, I think, going out in the Ottawa National Forest. And then that was the first half of the season. The later half, we were we, I drove to Wisconsin for a different project in an area called the Mokwa Barrens. It was like, uh, it's like a research forest. And it's this really unique habitat with, it's just different because that whole area has glaciation and um, it's flat and there's a lot of logging that happened historically. So it's kind of like this blanket of trees, but this area kind of had almost like, um, almost, it's not necessarily grassland, but it was really interesting shrubland. There's uh, a cool mix of plant diversity and there were sharp-tailed grouse there that they were looking to do habitat restoration in, and they were doing some studies on what kind of plants are out there. So I helped out with that project. Oh, cool. Yeah. So then I came back and then I think that helped me get my position in kind of falls working with the spotted owl. Nice. Nice. And now you're yeah. out in Arizona now. Yeah. You, you're. Yeah. I'm out in Arizona now. Um, I graduated from 
OSU and I, I, went, I went and worked for a consulting firm called Turnstone Environmental Consultants where I did more spotted owl work. This okay. is a private firm and I worked in Southern Oregon um, near, near Medford a lot. And I worked primarily on, on private timber company lands and real land management land. And then there was an opportunity for me to work with Marvel Roulettes. It's an, it's an endangered, um, threatened, uh, I believe it's threatened right now. Um, one of the spotted owls for sure endangered. I mean, there's like the Endangered Species Act that happens and you have different listings for animals, but it, they're uh, a, a shorebird that will um, come in when they're breeding, mainly around June to August. And they primarily nest on old growth forests and old growth forests are in short supply in the Pacific Northwest. So for one, they once they're out on the ocean, they're very vulnerable to fishing nets. And then they only have one, one probably one egg that probably hatches, one or two. Um, and they fly in early in the morning from the ocean and you have to look up in the sky for two hours, 45 minutes before sunrise and an hour and 25 minutes, I believe, after sunrise, um, just looking for this bird. And sometimes it'll just be like a fly over. What was that it? I don't know. But <laughs> a lot of times you just have to listen and get really familiar with bird calls and you know, just have like an intimate experience with the forest, listening and looking for this cryptid creature. Once you find them, you kind of you kind of know after that. Yeah. Uh, where you're like, all right, that's that's. Yeah. I I mean I I would you would listen for them and I mean to this day if I hear them I kind of tense up or there's oh, a lot yeah. of birds that kind of sound like the the marble and roulette because it, it's like this quick it's like a weird keer sound and it's like a shorebird out in the middle of the woods which is very unique and distinct right. but a lot of woodpeckers or other birds can make noises that are kind of similar um, but. You just have to have experience with it. And that was an amazing experience I had. I was working up um, doing surveys in the Tillamook State Forest mm. and other areas, private timber forests near Astoria and Amlet, Oregon. And you know, near Bay City, Oregon was where I was living out of in that area. But that was fun as well. Like, I really enjoyed that too. Well, and I'm sure too, because some of those private spots, like there's good private land out there. So like you get some neat spots where you're like, oh, wow, that's pretty or that's that's a nice view. Yeah, and um, there's a lot of timber company land out there. Um, you know that they're not, they're trying to make money. And there's been a lot of stories from coworkers about how they heard a bird, but just because you hear a bird doesn't mean that you can establish that they're actually nesting there. Right. Um, that they're occupying that area and sometimes they you just can't find the bird and they'll come back the next year and it'll be logged so stuff like that happens um don't care yeah yeah brian i didn't i didn't realize you'd work done all that other work in the great lakes region and some of these other like in all over oregon really you were in like all regions of oregon at one yeah time. You also, if I remember correctly, worked in Sayuslaw Forest and then... Yeah, I, I worked the longest in the Sayuslaw National Forest. I got a position at the Pacific Northwest, Northwest Research Station where they're doing the biggest acoustic project in the world where they have these acoustic detectors. Um, they call them ARUs, but they're, it means Autonomous Recording Unit. And they set they put them out all the way from California, Oregon, and Washington. And they will listen passively to monitor for species of interest. And there's northern spotted owl all over the this matrix of land. And it, it, it there's some controversy with when callback surveys are what I told you about because you get the caller out and you, for one you're agitating the bird. You might pull off a nest, and there's another I guess invasive species called the barred owl that is really taking over the habitat of the northern spotted owl mainly there 
endemic to eastern side, but they've came over to the west and they are a more they're generalist species that can they're bigger, they can eat more things and they're just out competing the northern spotted owl that mainly forages on um red tree voles and flying squirrels and um they're just not as aggressive. And when you make that call out in the woods, barred owls will come and attack me or they'll attack the recorder, swoop down at you. Um, and if there is a northern spotted owl that responds back to your calling, then that means that you're, you're opening it up for this aggressive behavior from a uh, species that's competing with you. Mm -hmm. And that led to researchers using this passive monitoring technique of putting recorders out there. We put them out during the day, which is nice because you don't have to get night. And then it records for at least six weeks. You pick it back up and then you bring it back to the, the lab and you have validation people that will listen to the to the audio and I thankfully got the opportunity to work over the winter with the validation crew. What they do is that you have millions of hours of recordings of all types of animal species out there and like how do you parse through all of that to get to um, the owl and they put it through a AI called a convolutional neural network they call it CNN and it was developed um, with a lot of help from a lot of great minds. They put this recording information there and it's filtered into this black box. You couldn't ask me how it works because I don't know, but it goes through that and then it tells you with uh, a degree of certainty if this is like 99% spotted owl and it goes down, 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 down. down. And a lot of times it, it could be um, dogs. I've had trucks out there that are, have like really heavy bass and on the spectrogram where you're reading this on um, on the computer program that we use to look at them and validate it. Because you have to have humans to listen to it and then say for certain that that might be an owl. You're looking for right. what the cadence of the calls are, what the frequency is, um, investigating to see if it actually is, because it'd be, it's really important if you actually do get an owl that for certain you can say, yeah, we have an owl out there. And I think it's the coolest thing ever. Yeah, no, I mean, that sounds fun. It definitely yeah. is. You, like you're more into it. like owls are kind of one of those to me species like i've seen them uh quite a few times in in passing you know me and mark had an encounter and we were in iceland last summer there was one that just like flew in front of the car which was like kind of wild at the time like the timing of it was wild and then like just on different drives i've seen some um and then we had a great horned owl uh fly into a window at our house wow uh, <laughs> died because like it was like is big square window and then like across the room it was the kitchen across the room there was another window so i think it thought it you could like fly through yeah yes boom and it, the thing was six feet long the wings and i mean they got a few of our cats over the years so at least we got one right no i'm just kidding <laughs> but we <laughs> actually ended up putting it and giving it to my grandpa who gave it to uh he gave to someone for beating okay well definitely he he got rid of it traditionally i guess you got rid of it the traditional way <laughs> yeah I, that's uh yeah there's a there's there's a pair of great horn owls outside of my where i'm living at right now so i think it's like the coolest thing ever oh they're cool they're really cool. yeah like for me it, it's just if there's an apex predator out there that means there's enough i guess habitat structure forage animals for it to even eat right um, it's just an indicator to me that the landscape could support owls and i think it's really cool to just hear them out there and listen to them but yeah they'll kill cats and stuff they, they get big and um i think they're just fascinating yeah no they are really cool animals i mean we went hunting last year and had three of them sitting above our tent and i mean it wasn't fun then because you're trying to sleep and like i swear oh to yeah God, like they would just hoo, 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 right there and then like fly across mm -hmm. And they go away for a little while and then they'd come back. So it wasn't like, it wasn't like a cadence, you know? So it was so yeah. random that you just wake up every time. You're like this freaking guy, but <laughs> it was, it's cool. It's always a cool time. Um, I, I guess I got a couple questions here for you. One being um, when you talk about this stuff and you, you kind of, it sounds like you took like, you got, you found different programs for native Americans, which is good. When I worked, I worked for the BLM uh, when I was going to MSU Billings, and uh, I worked as a park ranger at Pompey's Pillar, 
they kind of they oh, had a cool. program through uh Salish Kootenai College, which is a tribal college here in Montana, through through uh, Pompey's Pillar, which is kind of it was really cool. Is where Clark signed his name on the Lewis and Clark Trail. Um, so I, I get what you're saying, and it's really cool that we have those programs. So I guess is there any advice you may have for anybody out there, kind of maybe trying to take a similar route, working with like the federal government in like these spaces and these sectors that you may have. Yeah, I, uh, I think for me, the, I, I can't stress enough to get in a professional uh, society. And when you're going to school, the cost for being a part of that is you get the student fee. And then you can, there's so many opportunities that can come up. And um, for me, that, that's pretty much how I got my foot in the door with working for a federal agency. And you're just around other people and then they'll pass around job positions or if there's people that have opportunities for them, like being Native American, that's just what you can expect to find, hopefully. And more than likely, you probably will. Um, I'm not a part of the society right now because the professional fees are really expensive, but uh, I'd like to join back again um, once I get a professional job. But yeah, get, get into the society, volunteer a lot. Um, Get out there, see if you even like it. I've heard stories about people who go out into the woods and I talk to them about it, and but it's really some of the most toughest work that tough work that I've ever done. Like people will go out in the woods on a field trait field day and then they'll quit because it's like I gotta work in the rain 10, 12 hours a day. Yeah, <laughs> you do. Like it's it's not for everybody, but um if you really like it, if you're passionate about the outdoors, you want to be outside that it's that's all it really matters right no that's definitely yeah i remember we had a couple 115 degree days at pompey's pillar where you're just out there well i was laying on the rock like that i was like i hate yeah. this no, like i mean i didn't hate it i loved i like being outdoors so i love the job don't get me wrong but you know when it's that hot you're like i hate this it's really it could be just just mentally and physically and now we would like to take you to our segment, Music on a Native Podcast. This week, Randy Wood, Look How the Stars Shine for You. Shine for you, 
stars shine for you um yes me i just remember this last field season i was working in walla walla washington okay. for for the forest service as well and there's a lot of days we we're out there hiking and there was a heat wave and i'd take with me like a gallon of water but um a lot of time i'd be running across canyons just with like a bucket because i had a bucket doing water work and trying to shield against the sun and I was hiding in a cave for probably 30 minutes, trying not to like overheat and get heat exhaustion and running down on the river to get like, I had a hard hat and just dunked water over my head so I didn't like, pass out <laughs> or, you know, be like crap. Um, yeah. Necessary stuff. I, guess, I remember you telling me that story and it was just like, because Bobby, our friend Bobby was complaining about a mishap during our elk hunting this year and us and i i got dropped off and there's a gate on a road so i'm walking like miles because he didn't check the maps or something <laughs> and so i'm walking and, and brian's like that's just a day on the job in forestry <laughs> yeah it's nice when you can walk on the road because a lot of time you, you're not even on the road you're just bushwhacking it walking. um a lot of times in the i think the site law is probably the craziest area that we're good because Essentially, rainforest, and a lot of time I'm just crawling under the brush. Like, I gotta take my backpack off and I'm crawling underneath the ground and going over stuff. Those those coastal forests for the viewers, they're no joke, like how dense and thick. Well, and I'm sure over there, because my uncle, he worked in the US Forest Service out of Dillon, Montana, here. And uh, he was telling me, like, because he used to have to go survey the people, like the homeless people in the forest. I'm sure over there in Oregon, you encounter some just crazy shit. Like oh, that. yeah. <laughs> yeah, tons of that. I've, I've driven up to people that were passing out in the middle of the road. Um, sometimes this guy, I, we're, we're, oftentimes you get a map and then you, you're trying to read it and you're like, maybe we could walk this way up this decommissioned road and you'd park and there'd be a creepy van and then you get out and then talk to them and guy comes at you his mustache is green <laughs> i don't know and then he's just like <laughs> asking us if you want like coffee and he's obviously like he we immediately got up and then like a white baggie fell on the ground oh, and he picked God. it up put it in his pocket and he, he didn't have any shoelaces on it's just the thumbs are out and it's just this, this guy out there that was just getting high and super nice but you never know what could happen out there sure i'm especially oregon forest i am sure you use <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Yes. If there is a God, please. 
<laughs> Thankfully, there's been um, never really had any bad experience. But when I was out in Southern Oregon, I would do I do the owl calls. I don't know if it's because a lot of times sometimes I don't, I don't even tell people that I work with owls because when you're around those old logging towns during the the logging wars where they shut down a lot of logging to protect the spotted owl, they they'd kill the owls and put them out in front of the town. And, um, they rate they pop the tires of force or like employee tires and stuff. Um, I hear about the stories and it's wild, but I'm gassing up my truck. I, I just tell them I'm out there surveying birds or something because a lot of the times people would get, I've had it, my coworkers didn't know that or they forgot I told them about it. And I'd hear, I have to hear like an earful from them. Like, Why are you trying to save the mouths? Like, let them all die and stuff like that. And like, I'm just trying to get gas. <laughs> like, I don't really right. want to get into it. Oh, but I mean, at the same time, too, it's like, as you're saying, it's an apex predator. You're showing that the the environment, the natural environment, the indigenous environment is healthy, you yeah. know, with those, those species. Like, that's, I'm a, like, I get it with the wolves out here. I'm, I'm very much like team wolf because it's like, bro, the wolves were on the prairie. Wait till they can self-sustain on the prairie and then we can talk about hunting them. But until then, I don't want to hear. Same with the grizzly bear. Like, I don't want to hear it. We're not, you know, you chose to live in the mountains, but they naturally, yeah. like, that's where they went to hide. Because we freaking, we, you know, I say we, but like humanity, especially manifest destiny. That's really what did it. it pushed them, pushed them away. And a lot of that, there's no more large carnivores that will keep elk or deer populations healthy. Uh, a lot of a lot of the times they'll predate on ranchers or ranchers will kill um especially in arizona there's a lot of conflict with ranchers in arizona game fish with the mexican wolf that they're trying to bring back and it's it's a really sounds like it's a really stressful project whenever i talk to people or when i was around the the, the gaming fish employees that talked about it it just seems like there's a lot of turnover from having that conflict but that's the job of wildlife biologists and working with wildlife is to kind of resolve it. Kind of mediate it for the animals, right? You're kind of at, you're being you're standing up for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, just, you have to. I will, they can't speak for themselves, so you, a lot of times you have to advocate for the animals, and right. um, it's hard to convey why that's valuable because a lot of times people put value in animals monetarily or tangible thing, but it's like intrinsically they're there's 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 always value in having biodiversity and having like that heritage of having wildlife not only for my kids or future generations so like they can enjoy them there's oh there's spotted owls out in the woods there's we care enough about life to protect just small mammals insects plants i think it's i think it's a very beautiful thing that our, that we have that um heritage and legacy that we're working towards no, I agree. I, I I like it. I like what how you kind of summed it up there because that's 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 true. It's it's these animals they do so much. Um, we don't realize it, but really, what like they they've adapted worldwide. I mean, you take like the pheasant, you take the sage grouse, you take certain birds like that. You take the the bison, the water buffalo, all that. How they're similar on these different continents, but they're different in their own ways because they adapted to the climates, they adapted to the other animals and surroundings, all that. So it's crucial that you keep these populations too, you know, because like you say, there's other owls, there's barn owls now in infiltrating on their territory, which wasn't in, wasn't natural. So what does that do to the bugs? What does that do to the trees? Because the bug, you know, that the, of what they eat, it's such a domino effect that we don't even understand it that yeah it's wild cascading yeah but okay. that's for another that's for another podcast mm -hmm. and another episode because we're kind of kind of coming at our time here mm -hmm. uh kind of we get into it we kind of have our like last words uh matt i'm gonna do you have anything before that i'll get into brian or 
Yeah, yeah, Brian, I know uh, you touched on Walla Walla a little bit, but did just kind of a last question. Did you work directly with any tribes or I think you said you did a fish project with the Umatilla, some Umatilla tribal members? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, um, I was I was attached to a project that I was hired for where I was doing environmental DNA sampling where I go out a lot of the, the areas, rivers, streams watersheds and I would sample it with suction cup with the peristaltic pump and they were looking for particulate part of part, particles of DNA or um, any information that that you can find specifically for western rich mussels and lamprey and lamprey is a very important resource for the tribes down there and the forest service knows that and uh, the tribes definitely know that and there probably was a partnership with the um, the person that started that project, his name was Eric Merton, um, he works out of Pendleton. But yeah, those species are on the sensitive list. And um, it was super cool going down those areas. It's tough work, but I mean, it's super to uh, find out if there are land prey in the area so that they could protect it and monitor that area and with the mussels as well. Um, and whenever I talk with about people, I always brought up the fact that it was. Um, just important to call um, something that should be protected, and I felt like uh, it was really important to do that. that I liked it. Nice. No, I definitely I saw the lamprey organ. They've done quite a few stories on that, and then I saw Naya actually has some lamprey at the the Native American Youth and Family Center there in Portland. Um. So yeah, that's kind of the podcast. Uh, we kind of wrap it up. We kind of give our guests. Uh, kind of what we call our final words you know we kind of wrap it up here at the end if there's anything you want to say promote talk about do whatever feel free um this is your moment to shine um if you have any advice whatever matt sometimes likes to shout out you know his his baby mamas his, <laughs> <laughs> his energy <laughs> um, you know I mean? so go I, ahead i think i'll leave it to you <laughs> yeah uh this is something that keeps popping up, I think, for a lot of wildlife professionals or people that work in outside. Uh, but especially with like the TikTok shorts or YouTube shorts, but a lot of people will like feed wildlife or they'll they'll walk up to them and stuff. Like don't <laughs> like I think a big part of it is like keeping wildlife wild. And right. It's important that wildlife know that um we're then they become dependent on us. They start hanging around us. And that just, that's not natural. That's not normal. And just particularly with deer, they'd come up to me. Um, if I'm parked at an area that's popular and they'll walk up to you, the, someone could hit the deer. Millions, or probably billions of dollars is probably lost um, every year. At least hundreds of millions from collisions with deer. Yeah. And there's a whole problem with that with the overpopulation of deer from the lack of natural predators, particularly in the, the Midwest and Eastern um, states of uh, the United States. But also, um, yeah, may, maybe also consider keeping your cat indoors. If you have a cat, I know cats are one of the most prolific hunters out there and they led to the extinction of multiple animal species and they, are they'll kill birds, small animals, insects. So if you have a cat, consider keeping it indoors. It's it's good for the keep the cat inside and keep the dogs inside or in an area that they're that you can supervise them. Maybe put a bell on the cat if you don't want to keep it inside, so that maybe you might alert some birds. But yeah, there's a lot of information out there about how we could better protect wildlife resources. And I think just maybe keeping those things in mind when people look at that stuff online or if they're wondering if they should keep their cat outside, um, do some more research on it. Um, I've spoken my tidbit about it, but yeah. I think no, it's good to know it's good education. I mean, even the bell on the cat is is something that's that's nice my i know my cousin jared he's talked about doing like he wants to build a catio he wants to do all this stuff he's never he's got to paint the house he's always like we're always joking yeah. he's always like i want to paint this blue and i'm like when are we gonna see it bud you know and yeah 
<laughs> but he's like, I want to build a catio. And uh and uh the because if he wanted to get a cat for the same reason, because he lives in uh, Paradise Valley, Montana, which is uh yeah. you know, he he really wants, you know, he's like, I don't want to affect the environment. He's like, I don't want to pay plant fake grass. He goes, I'm leaving the wild grass that my yard is. Yeah. The peas, the flowers, all that exactly. Yeah, and then plant plant native wildflowers and put out bat boxes and put out birdhouses. Right. Full Shazam. Right? Oh, I honestly. Yes. Yeah. Helpful. It's it's what we would what we did as natives on this land back in, in the day. You know, you think of like the black feet burning the fields. Think of the, mm -hmm. the I know Danae, you guys farmed a lot of corn down there. Like it's hard to do in the desert. You figure it out, you make it happen, right? Like we yeah. do that. We we understand this environment, this natural environment. And it's really cool to talk to you, a wildlife biologist, on that today. Uh Matt, any final words? Uh yeah. So, you know, I I really enjoyed listening to Brian's take on, you know, the forestry and what's um what what you know what are what are some things he's worked with some of the issues you know happening in the environment um the surveys and and it just it kind of made me think kind of segue off what you you just said zach um about you know how native people like managed worked with the land right to manage the landscape through prescribed burns through um different modes of you know uh like managing the plants and for the animals and you know bison there's a lot of research right now on how bison um in the plains their hooves facilitate in grasslands the growth of plants whereas like cattle's hooves tend to kill <laughs> the grass and the native um so there's the way their hooves are shaped they draw out the seeds and 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 facilitate native plant growth so it just made me think about that and just the importance of, um, you know, conservation and, and bringing and revitalizing even some of these landscapes. So, yeah, no, no, that's awesome. Man. So you see it, you see, I've, I've heard the American Prairie Reserve talk about exactly what Matt was talking about, uh, on my and Mark's podcast, Wandering Ways, we talked about interviewed them. Uh, Brian, I want to thank you so much for being on being our first interview. Uh, we want to thank our listeners as always for tuning in uh, this was a great one. Um, I'm glad that we had this conversation. It's it's exciting. We talked to a, a native wildlife biologist. So now you know. Now if you're in the know. Uh, I, yeah. uh, no. I will all... preface, not a wildlife biologist yet, but I'm in the works of works. getting that official title soon, hopefully. Okay. Well, yeah. basically, in my mind, you know more. You're, you've gone down yeah. the path. You've gotten the education. You've, you've done what it takes. You're going to get the title, it sounds like. It sounds like it's up mm -hmm. there so excited to see that happen but definitely thank you for being on um until next time bye bye On my back, daily drumming when I sing, man, there ain't no way around it. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a native podcast is produced by Gingy Advertising and Quartz Lake Productions.